Hey everyone, welcome to our Lunar New Year food and wine discussion. I'm Scott Jones, head of content here at Emails. Um, Emails and Penfolds have partnered to create a special Lunar New Year celebration menu, and it's paired with award winning Penfolds wines like the Ben 311 Chardonnay, the Ben 407 Cab, the Ben 389 Cab Shiraz. Now, for those of you who are new to the Lunar New Year, it's a festival typically celebrated in China and other Asian countries uh, that begins with the first new moon of the lunar calendar and ends on the first full moon. So it's 15 days. Um, this year is the year of the ox and the celebration runs from February 12th to the 26th. So it's two full weeks of festivities. Um, some of you may be new to Australian wines, uh, particularly those wines from Penfold. So we're gonna talk uh, through why this island continent is such a special place for world-class wine production. And then we're gonna touch on a few Penfold wines that you really need to know. Uh, and then we'll also uh, talk about uh, the menu's recipes and why these wine pairings uh, work so well and why they are um, going to be the cornerstone of any proper uh, Lunar New Year party. Uh, now, first, I want to welcome my co-host, uh, Master Sommelier uh, Jillian Balance from Penfolds. How's it going, Jillian? It's great. Thank you. What an awesome introduction. Thank you for filling us all in on the Lunar New Year, Year of the Ox. Very That's important right. agriculture. So. Uh, great that we're doing a wine tasting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Julian, let's talk about Australia. Um, when I first discovered wine back in the early 90s, it was um, those Aussie red blends that really got me hooked. Um, but I know for a lot of my friends, uh, many of them uh, think of Australia as like home to kangaroos, koala bears, uh, the dry, dusty outback. So, um, you know, they're not thinking lush vineyards and top-notch wine production. So help us understand uh, what's going on down under. Happy to do that. And, you know, I, I agree with you completely. I was drinking a lot of Australian wine in the 90s as well. I worked at Windows on the World and wow. we had a whole page of Penfold's uh, Grange, the icon wine. Yeah. And I familiarized myself and fell in love with this um, country as a winemaking region a very long time ago. <laughs> and of course, you know, we've seen the popularity kind of wax and wane over the years as other emerging regions come up and kind of compete in that same realm of right. the, you know, fruit forward kind of new world style wines. Um, but really, we feel like all you have to do is taste a Penfold's wine and you're sold. It doesn't, uh, you know, the wines are so fantastic. They kind of transcend any place or varietal or anything like that and really do represent a true house style. And yeah. you know, we can draw some parallels with California and Australia, right? Because California is warm, so is Australia. Um, we tend to see all the vineyards down in that southern um, tip there. Close well, that green area. Right? Or we see high altitude vineyards in South Australia. There really is a lot of diversity. Um, I think back in the 90s when there was a, a, a high demand for wines that were in a certain price point, you could see a lot of wine production going on up in the warmer areas, yeah. where higher yield, you get more generous fruit. But we've really seen this kind of, um, you know, way back to the real terroir and the real diversity and are starting to um, just embrace that and spread that message again. You can see down in the right-hand corner, that is a very old vine. So um, Australia, not only are the soils hundreds of millions of years old, layers and layers of geological diversity, but the vines are really old too. And you know they say that the more um, age on a vine, the more complex and concentrated the wine is gonna be kind of like people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So um, really a lot of great diversity again. And, and of course, specializing mainly in red varietals. I do think right. the Chardonnay efforts have been fantastic over the years. You know, um, it was our company that coined the term sunshine in a bottle because we get this really ripe, delicious Chardonnay. Yeah, um, yeah it's really kind of 
pulling apart and finding the, the exact terroirs that match the varietals now instead of overproducing. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know that um, especially the wines we're going to talk about uh, uh, today, we're going to look at Shiraz, we're going to look at Cabernet Sauvignon. So um, one thing I'd love for you to explain is what's the difference between Shiraz and Syrah? Ooh, is that a trick question? <laughs> Um, well, you know, the Aussies always like to do things differently. So um, Syrah can actually be uh, spelled in both of those ways. They choose to use uh, Shiraz. From what I understand, there's a city um, in what used to be Persia called Shiraz, where this grape supposedly um, originated from. And so right. that's why the Aussies kind of stick to uh, the, the very specific origins of the grape. Um, versus Syrah, which we kind of translated from the French. <laughs> Not to, so they're essentially the, the same grape, just spelled. They are the same grape. Yeah, okay. And, and, and unmistakably so, right? Shiraz has this really beautiful kind of bold fruit and peppery character. Yeah. I think no matter where in the world it's grown, it's, it's identifiable and, yeah. and unmistakable, really. Yeah, I always think of it as um, uh, cracked black pepper, uh, to me, is what I always get. Absolutely. And it doesn't matter if it's from a cool climate or a warm one, uh, you still get that peppery note. Yeah. And interestingly enough, I mean, Cabernet Sauvignon really didn't come onto the scene in Australia until the 60s and 70s when right. uh, Max Schubert kind of brought it over and, and wanted to um, emulate the great wines of Bordeaux. So, um, you know, Shiraz really is Australia's darling uh, variety. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that kind of leads us into the kind of the next thing I want to talk about. You've given us this um, Australian wine primer. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about Penfolds. Um, I mean, this is one of the kind of the first names in Australian wine, right? I mean, I to your point, uh, when I think of some of the world's most famous wines, that Penfolds Grange is, is on that list. Yep, and you really cannot pick up a wine book and not see the Penfolds name. Yeah. And, um, you know, very significant in the mid-1800s when people were coming over from the United Kingdom to colonize certain parts of Australia. Um, it was Dr. Penfolds who actually landed in Adelaide before Adelaide was even um, legally named um, a town. Yeah. Or, yeah. So, and so it starts back in 1844. Dr. Penfolds actually uh, made tonics. The, they, they started their business producing fortified wines. Yeah. It would prescribe as medication. It's a good thing we don't have to go to the doctor for that these days. But I still like that kind of medication. I have to be honest. <laughs> um, but if you think about it, people with insomnia, um, yeah. you know, dysentery, g g uh, gastrointestinal disorders, he was curing everyone with his special tonics. And that's really what kicked off um, the wine industry and wine business in Australia in the 1840s, and you're correct, yeah. they were uh, the original. Yeah, and and um, one thing I've, I, I do want, because uh, I I have enjoyed Penfolds wines for a long time, but what, what, tell us about the, the Ben naming uh, designation. Um, what's that mean? Yeah, and, and it is, it's integral to, to the, the, the DNA of Penfolds. Um, it basically means batch identification number. Right. Or, in. It was simply where specific wines were stored in the cellar. And there is a massive cellar at the original McGill Estate um, just outside of the town of Adelaide. And you can still see these bins that, you know, you, you okay. kind of picture them going, hey, where did you put that awesome uh, Shiraz from Barossa that we made? Oh, it's in bin whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and they coined the term. Um, people gravitate towards it, I swear. I mean, it took me a couple trips to Australia to see how beloved um, and individual and unique all of these bins are, and everybody's got their favorite. And if you think about Penfolds in the 1950s, when they were kind of flipping the wine world on its head in Australia, um, they were really the only game in town. So they had to produce wines that were identifiable and unique um, to, for their consumers. Yeah. And that's how the trend started. So, and it continues today. You know, when you talk about that commitment to high quality, Jillian, I mean, I find that um, as a brand, Penfolds has just continued. I mean, you know, yeah, we'd all love to enjoy a, a Grange one day, but 
um, you know, we're just looking at the wines that we're going to be talking about today that uh, the 389, the 407, even this 311 Chardonnay, which I can't wait to talk about. There, there's such this um, high um, bar for uh, for not only uh, really high quality, but still um, really, really a lot of value, even when you're, you know, having a special wine like that. Um, so have they, have they just figured out the, the right places to grow these grapes and the right uh, vineyard locations? I mean, you know, it sounds like this is an ongoing quest for, you know, the perfect grapes, the perfect um, viticultural <laughs> area to create the perfect bottle. It's two things. It's their spirit of innovation, but it's also um, their history and tradition, right? Yeah. Um, you can only achieve this kind of house style, this consistency, the great vineyards that we've developed um, by having done it for a very long time. So yeah. Yeah. 175 years of winemaking. Um, also developing techniques that, that um, really work well with the fruit that they're growing. So different winemaking techniques are employed that sometimes seem a little rudimentary, but they do contribute greatly to the Penfolds that that lush fruit without being really overripe or overly alcoholic. Yeah, yeah. It's jointed. They're yeah. very seamless and integrated and beautiful. And it's something that they've mastered over the years for sure. Yeah, that's one thing that's always, um, not always, but I'm, I'm always, um, um, you know, looking out for when I'm, especially when I'm having a new world wine from a, um, a, a pretty mild climate, maybe a little warm. I feel like the alcohol can get, you know, out of balance. Um, you know, the fruit, the extraction can get, you know, almost too, too much. It's, it's really cool to understand how they've used innovation to both be a new world winery, but still, you know, embody the principles of, you know, kind of an old world European wine. It's, it's really cool. Scott, you hit the nail on the head for sure. And I can't tell you how many blind tastings um, with these wines that I've done and totally botched. <laughs> like, yeah. Guessing that they were from old world regions when they're actually from Australia. And you're right. It's that really great balance of fruit and, and the nod to the old world that I think makes these wines so delicious and, and enjoyable. And kind of puts us in a little bit in that higher price point in terms of the spend, but well worth it. And, and you also mentioned high alcohol, right? And what happens when you have overly alcohol wines? Um, they don't balance with food very well. Yeah, I was going to say it's a head-on collision. Yeah, so, so I think what you guys have mastered at emails is, is definitely finding those wines that yeah. work her beautifully with food. You're not yeah. just wines up there for the heck of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. And um, that's a perfect segue into um, kind of looking at this menu. So we start out with the, um, the Asian noodle dumpling soup. And, um, you know, uh, for those again, for those of you who are new to the Lunar New Year and Chinese New Year, um, all of these dishes uh, represent um, a very uh, specific um, good luck ingredients that have deep symbolism and um, the, what I love about this recipe is it combi combines two of the most important symbolic ingredients, which is dumplings and noodles. And, um, uh, so, and, it's, a, and it's a really hearty broth and a, a really robust broth uh, and, a, and a hearty soup. Um, and it's paired with this wonderful uh, Ben 311. And Jillian, I can't wait for you to talk about it because not only is it a great pairing, but for all of my friends out there who say they um, I don't like Chardonnay because they get the kind of, you know, Napa style where it's buttery and oaky and just this huge uh, wine. This is a little more restrained, very much um, about acidity, minerality, and it's like the perfect thing to like link up to a soup like this. Absolutely. And you, you, you said it well, um, dumplings are a big part of the celebration for, um, you know, wishing good luck and good fortune and and Penfolds actually is one of the top selling Australian wines in yeah. China, um, probably because of that beautiful Penfolds red, which is such a lucky color too, um, and proximity uh, to, to Asia from Australia. But we do very, very well. So if anybody's having a virtual celebration, these wines are globally yeah. uh, um, accessible, right? So you can you can enjoy Penfolds with with friends and family near and afar. 
But the cool climate Chardonnay aspect really comes from years of developing uh, vineyards in areas, crazy areas like Tasmania, um, like up near the snowy Alps, um, cool climate vineyards that will give us that acid, right? Yeah. But yeah. then we don't use a lot of new oak because new oak barrels will give you that toasty flavor. And really with the cleanliness of the dumplings and the, the hearty broth and everything, you kind of want something that's going to um, let those flavors stand out. Yeah than challenge them. And that's what I think the bin 311 does beautifully. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And a side note, um, Australia has Alps too. I love that you threw that in there um, for those who are um, uh, following along uh, on their map at home. <laughs> oh yeah, we have snow in, in most of the vineyards every year for, yeah. for 11. That's, that's, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> and then the next one we have um, is um, this wonderful stir fry. And again, you talk about um, you know fish, shrimp play an important part in um, any proper um, uh, kind of table setting recipe feast. And this has um, uh, a shrimp, um, and it has this. What I love about this is this kind of roller coaster of textures and flavors. Um, and and I love that about these dishes. Um, and um, I was really blown away. Um, when you pick the uh, 389, um, I, this is one of my favorite wines because um, I love the, these, these two grapes together um, in this bottle make something that's wonderful and magic. So um, please tell us how a red wine, kind of the tannins and the acidity work with a dish like this. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think that for the bin 389, I feel like the tannins are really supple. Yeah. Um, and I looked at the dish, kind of the shrimp, the, the cashews, which are meaty. Yeah, yeah, very, very rich. Um, the broccoli has this, you know, you know, texture as well. Yeah. We're using things subtly like soy sauce, some of those umami characteristics. 389 has that in spades. I mean, it's, yeah. it's layered with, with um, kind of those balsamic soy um, and not overly... Uh, jammy or fruity, it's got some really nice dark fruit, but very subtle tannins that I think um, work beautifully with this dish. And normally you would say, well, shrimp, shouldn't I be um, enjoying a white wine with that yeah. because of the brininess of shrimp? But I think all of the other additions and the preparation method really yeah. make this very hearty and suitable to, to drinking a, a delicious red wine. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think that that's something, uh, Jillian, that can't be lost when it comes to um, many Asian dishes and wine pairing is the umami. And, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, yes, you find it in lots of cuisines, but it's really finds its its natural home in Asian cooking. And, you, you know, that um, can sometimes uh, be a struggle uh, for, you know, when you're pairing wine, but this, as to your point, um, this has that ability to come alongside that. And the other thing is the, the tannin. And for those of you who are maybe kind of new to wine, uh, tannins are, um, do a lot of things in wine. They help preserve the wine. They help to kind of cleanse the palate if you have a really rich dish. But if, if they're um, kind of over-indexing in tannin, it can kind of dry your mouth in an unpleasant kind of way. So um, when you say supple tannins, you, you're meaning kind of a smooth, yes, you get that drying effect and, and the, the things that tannins are supposed to be doing, but it's not that where you feel like the enamel's been stripped off your teeth. <laughs> yeah, and, and depending on how you um, get tannins, right? So they're found in the, in the skins of grapes, but you right. can also get it from um, oak aging. The toasting on the yeah. inside of the barrel can impart tannins too. We're looking really at grape tannin, right? That doesn't have that bitter drying effect. Yeah is grapey um, and lush, right? Yeah. So you're, you, you're right. The tannins are just enough to kind of cut through really some of the oils and rich characteristics of the dish, the fattiness of cashews, right? How it coats your palate, yeah. um, not be that, that um, challenging. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, um, our, our last uh, recipe that we're going to talk about is just, uh, first of all, I love this photo. Um, and I, and I, I, love, I love this pairing, this rich um, London broil with this Cabernet Sauvignon. 
Um, you've got this soy, you've got the dark sesame oil, you have these really robust, rich, deep flavors. Um, and um, if you're gonna prepare this recipe, and I hope everyone does, um, when you use a cast iron skillet, it really caramelizes uh, the exterior of that, of that steak and really creates this wonderfully um, uh, savory crust. And you've got that rich um, uh, meat on the inside. So tell us, uh, Jillian, why this cab is such a home run with this dish. <laughs> My mouth is watering. <laughs> Um, yeah, bin 407, it's, it's just so, so classic and representative of yeah. penfolds of our development of these great um, Cabernet Sauvignon vineyards in the Kunawara, mainly the Kunawara area of South Australia that sits on this great bed of limestone. So the vines really have to dig deep for their nutrients. It gives us a lot of complexity in the wine. I always think of Australian Cabernet Sauvignon as having that slight savory note to, like you mentioned, that kind of umami note. Right. Cabernet Sauvignon also can have some really nice, very subtle green, um, almost green peppercorn character, yeah. some, some uh, vegetal, slight, slightly greenish. And I think with the bok choy, that's probably, you know, it, it's a home run. To link that up, yeah. Yeah, and, and then again, with Cabernet Sauvignon, I, see, I wouldn't pair, necessarily pair this with the teriyaki with a Napa Cabernet because right. it's so much more fruit driven. The tannins are so much more pronounced that it would probably kind of challenge the, the subtle, uh, wonderful flavors of the dish. So I think the 407 is just, um, it's just a, a wonderful uh, selection to pair with this. Yeah, that's a great comment um, as it relates to, um, say, um, picking the 407 Cabernet versus um, a, a big, bold cab from Napa Valley. Um, and, and one of the bullet points down there is a new world example of Cabernet, but yet still in almost that, um, not austere, but much more of a cooler climate or um, less assertive version of cab that, that lets the, the wonderful um, flavors and um, all of the wonderful things from acidity to structure that Cabernet can bring to the table. It kind of lets it do that in this particular example of, of cab. Yeah, I could, I could probably have this like at least six out of the total lunar celebration night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the great thing. You can repeat this and keep enjoying Penfold's wines throughout, which I hope everyone does. But man, um, talk about a Cabernet Sauvignon that has such class and elegance to it. And like you said, that kind of umami savory notes that, that pair beautifully with the, with the teriyaki. Yeah, I would totally uh, make this one night in this, in this format and then take the leftovers and uh, thinly slice that London broil and make little um, Asian uh, tacos out of it, put a little <laughs> sauce on it and sit on my back porch uh, with a bottle of this wine. That Love to me it. would be uh, just the absolutely perfect, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, afternoon. and I, I would encourage um, your subscribers out there when they're making these beautiful dishes and, and preparing uh, to open the wine. You know, yeah. open open the 389 and the 407 because we're although we're talking about supple tannins and stuff these wines do need a little bit of breathing time yeah. been in the bottle for a couple of years so highly recommend maybe enjoying some 311 while your 407 and 389 are are kind of uh, letting some oxygen uh, open it up and and really get those flavors and aromatics out yeah that's a great point I guess um you know, before we go, uh, just maybe touch on uh, the, the proper serving temperature, because I feel like um, in any situation, we tend to serve our white wines a little too cool and our red wines a little too warm. And when you're having special wines like this, you want to get the temperature right. So I would say probably likewise, you wouldn't want to have that 311 ice cold, right? No, not ice cold. Um, I would say somewhere in the low 50s. Okay, good. For the reds, maybe in the low 60s. Yeah, great. A, a slight coolness to the reds because 
think about um, as you're eating and tipping your glass back, air is going to get in. It's going to warm up quite a bit. So never be, you know, um, afraid of, of ha having the wines a touch cool at the start because they, they will um, warm up and, and evolve. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great point and a great takeaway. Uh, whether you're um, uh, enjoying these recipes and these wines at, at home, or whether you're ordering pinfolds uh, at your favorite restaurant, um, just because you're at a restaurant doesn't mean that um, uh, you don't want your. You, I mean, you're still looking for your wines to be uh, served at the proper temperature. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Oh man. Well, I am absolutely starving. Uh, I don't know about you. I know you said your mouth was watering. So I, I mean, it's, um, I'm, I'm ready to dig in. And um, you actually pointed this out. But the cool thing about these recipes and the pinfold wine pairings is that um, this is pretty much evergreen stuff. So you we can, you know, enjoy these during uh, Lunar New Year. But we can also enjoy these anytime. Uh, we're in the mood for an Asian inspired meal. I mean, this is, um, you can make these things year round. So um, excited to dive in uh, and um, try these um, as uh, over the course of the couple of weeks of the Lunar New Year. Well, thank you, Scott. And thank you for selecting Penfolds as, as, the, as the, the partnering wine to kick yeah. off celebration. It's certainly exciting. And, and um, I think that People will not be disappointed uh, with with the penfold selections or or the dishes and and the preparations and all those lovely flavors. So, yeah, I agree. It's um, it's been phenomenal. Um, again, I've I've known penfold wines, but uh, getting to to know them on a deeper level and certainly having the expert insight uh, just to you know take a you know peel back a, another layer of um, education on on wines that I already love. So. Um, Everyone on behalf of Emails and Penfolds, uh, Julie and I would like to thank you for joining us. We hope that you learned something and have been inspired to try these recipes with these wonderful uh, Penfolds wines. And most importantly, we both wish you a wonderful and very festive Lunar New Year. So cheers to everyone. Absolutely, cheers. <laughs>